Hey guys, welcome back once again to the show, where I take a look at some of the worst reviewed movies of all time and look into what is it that makes them so bad. Now back in the 1980s, a monster movie about a bunch of little creatures came out and it was extremely popular. It made a ton of money at the box office and actually still remains as one of my favorites. That movie was Gremlins. This movie is Hobgoblins. Now Hobgoblins and Gremlins share some similarities. Hobgoblins came out in the 1980s as well. It's a monster movie about a bunch of little creatures. However, the impact was pretty much the exact opposite of Gremlins. And the reception to it was pretty much the exact opposite as well. It was not good. Now this movie has been requested countless times by you guys. I still get messages about it, so I figured, you know what? This is it, this is the year <laughs> that I do Hobgoblins. So this is what this episode is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, Hobgoblins. Now I can't say for certain that this movie was made to try and capitalize off the success of movies like Gremlins and Critters, but I do have my suspicions, including the fact that the Hobgoblins pretty much look exactly like a combination of the two. Like if a gremlin and a critter started banging and like produced a love child, you know, this would be it. So the film starts on a movie studio where Dennis is getting scolded by the senior security guard, Mr. McCready, for listening to music while he's on the job. You're being paid to work around here, not to sit around and blast your eardrums. Hey, 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 take it easy. I can do both. Hello? Hello? Didn't you hear the phone ringing? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, so this is confusing. The phone rang once, so why are we acting like it's been ringing for a while? Like, didn't you hear the phone ringing? Oh, you mean just now? For a split second before you picked it up? Yeah, no, I don't think I heard that. What does he mean by no, I didn't? The phone is right in front of him. They've already hung up. Well, then it couldn't have been too important, huh? Don't you have any sense of responsibility? That could have been a very important call. However, I'm gonna have to side with Dennis when it comes to the importance of the call here. Like, if the caller hangs up after the first ring, usually a pretty good indication that the call was not important at all. Like, who calls, like, oh, there's an emergency. Oh, crap, they didn't pick up right away. Oh, we're all dead. So they start doing their rounds, and McCready's boss calls him on the radio, asking to speak with him. And McCready kind of argues with him, saying that he can't right now. <laughs> really? Like, it was like a few minutes ago you were harping on Dennis about how, you know, the phone, the phone call could have been so important. And now that the boss has called you directly on the radio, asking to speak with you, your response is just, oh, no, sorry, can't, busy right now. Sorry, boss. Yes, we're currently walking around the studio. I have my routine and I'm not willing to break it after all these years. Nope, not gonna happen. Sorry, not even for you, my employer. You know, you could have called us on the phone and let it ring for more than once. You know, you had your chance. I tried calling you at the main gate before. Why didn't you answer the phone? I, I must have caught it just as you hung up. Well, let's be a, a little more efficient from now on. Yes, I waited and waited an entire one ring and you didn't pick up. What the f is wrong with you? Yes, I realized that I could have just called you on the radio like I just did, but damn it, I'm a diehard fan of the rotary phone. That's a technology that's here to stay. I'll probably never get rid of that. Definitely not in the next decade. Dennis goes into the film vault, even though he was told not to go in there. Then he starts hallucinating about being a rock star. And I like how the stage and the microphone are part of the hallucination, but not the band, or the crowd, or the lyrics, apparently. And then he suddenly falls off the stage a few feet to his death, even though he's still breathing. So McCready does some quick thinking and closes the vault. And I'm just wondering, why was it open in the first place? I mean, it's a vault door, right? What's the point of having a giant vault door if you're just gonna leave it open? Isn't that the point of having the door? To lock it? So McCready tells the boss that Dennis just quit and 
Apparently this isn't the first time he's had to cover something like this up. It's happened twice before. I guess those guards didn't have families or friends or just know anyone who cared enough to investigate why they just suddenly disappeared. So Kevin gets the job as the new guard. When he comes home to his girlfriend, who is either very prudish or traveled here in a time machine from the 50s, she tells him that his friends are there. His friend Daphne is waiting for her boyfriend to come back from army training because they haven't had sex in two months and she's ready to explode. You know what a man wants when he's been away for two months? No, what does he want? <laughs> and his friend Kyle seems to be addicted to calling a phone sex line. Not sure why he would carry around the entire newspaper when he could just cut out the ad, or just memorize the number. I'm sure it can't be too difficult to memorize the number 976 Skag. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get some of that Skag tonight. So Daphne's boyfriend Nick tells Kevin that he'll teach him hand-to-hand -hand combat, but Kevin really isn't into it. Now there are quite a few elements to this scene that I find hilarious. The sound effects. The abysmal fight choreography, this, this isn't really even a fight scene. They're just bashing two sticks together. And even bashing is a stretch. They're just knocking two sticks together, really. And of course, the length of the scene. You'd think that after Nick knocked Kevin down the first time, that would be it, but it's not. Kevin gets up and they basically do the exact same thing all over again. So when Kevin gets knocked down the second time, you'd probably think, okay, that's gotta be it but it's not, it just keeps going. It just goes on and on and on. Now I've edited this for time, obviously, but as you can probably guess, there's really no reason for this fight scene to run two and a half minutes in length. And I thought the whole purpose of the scene was to teach Kevin hand-to-hand -hand combat. Nick doesn't teach anything here, and it's clearly obvious that Kevin isn't learning anything, except that Nick is kind of an asshole. Yes, I guess Nick's proficiency in garden tool combat is enough to make Daphne swoon so hard that she just has to take him into the van so that they can bang for an entire 20 seconds while Amy berates Kevin about just how disappointed she is in his skills with a hoe. For some reason, Kevin is just hell-bent on impressing Amy, a task which is proving to be quite difficult. Yeah, I guess having a job in a house means nothing if you can't beat up your friend on the front lawn. What do you do about someone who you can never make happy? Dump them. It's kind of the obvious answer here. While Kevin is explaining to McCready why his girlfriend has nothing but contempt for him, a guy appears on the security camera trying to look like the most suspicious person of all time. So McCready goes to check it out, and this is probably one of my favorite shots of the entire movie because of just how unintentionally funny it is. McCready is in the golf cart driving to the location, but there's really no point because the location is maybe 50 feet away from where they are. I mean, look, once the guy pulls a knife on him, Kevin is able to take out his gun and run over there in two seconds. And also, what, what is this guy even doing here? What, like, is he planning on stealing something? What? It, the studio is, it's not even running, it's closed. So what would you, <laughs> what would you take? Well, I guess he could steal the, uh, the valuables in the film vault because we all know they leave the door wide open. I'll go to soundstage two, you know, steal one of the sets out of there, piece by piece, all by myself, you know. Only take me a few months. So Kevin goes looking for the guy and decides that he probably went into the area with the vault. So he sets the radio down on the floor for some reason. Is that so he could sneak up on the guy? Well, if you're worried about the sound coming from the radio, why don't you just turn it off? That way you still have it if you need it. Kevin figures the guy is probably behind this giant vault door and again, like, the door isn't even locked. McCready arrives to prevent Kevin from going into the vault, and I guess it's implied here that something escapes from the vault. And it's the Hobgoblins, who are now driving around in the cart, chasing down Kevin and McCready, 
They dodge out of the way, and I guess during that time, the hobgoblins escaped because now the cart is just sitting there empty. I don't understand. What just happened? The vault. I, I tried to warn you. Those creatures. The, the vault. I tried. All my work. 30 years I've been trying to prevent this from happening. To, to prevent what from happening? But, but those creatures, why, why do you think I spent the last 30 years of my life here? Really, 30 years, 30 years. And in 30 years, it never occurred to you to, I don't know, maybe lock the vault door? So McCready goes on to tell the story about how 30 years ago he was working and this alien ship came down. I also love the non-reaction here to discovering alien life. McCready explains that the Hobgoblins destroyed the movie studio by tapping into people's brains and making them live out their wildest fantasies, which I guess somehow killed them. And then he tells Kevin that if he sees anyone acting out their fantasies, that means a hobgoblin is nearby and to kill the hobgoblin. Okay, so obviously these things are incredibly dangerous. They ruined a movie studio, they kill people, or they cause people to kill themselves, whatever. So why have you spent the past 30 years working here trying to keep these things hidden? What's the purpose of that? Is that the only reason you're working here? Because you have to keep these things hidden from the public? There just seems to be an obvious solution here that would have saved you the past three decades. You have a gun. It's, it's part of your job. You know where the hobgoblins are. They're inside the film vault. Okay, so walk into the film vault. Bang, bang, bang. Kill, kill the hobgoblins. Shoot them. Problem solved. You're totally fine with them killing other people, but oh, I don't want to kill the, the alien creatures that are killing people. I just got to keep them hidden. Murder them. El eliminate them. Wipe them out. Does that make me a violent person? I don't think so. I think that just makes me a very practical person. Anyways, back at Kevin's house, his friends are having a dance party. I guess that's what this is. And then the hobgoblins show up and start attacking them. And I mean, I guess there's not much else you can do with a bunch of puppets. So then Nick comes up with the great idea to use a grenade to kill them. Yes, these are the people in your life, Kevin. Amy, your girlfriend who loves to talk down to you. Kyle, who uses your phone for erotic sex chat and then leaves you with the bill. And Nick, who currently wants to throw a live grenade into your living room. So Kevin finally comes home and turns off the lights. This causes the hobgoblins to leave because according to McCready, they're attracted to bright lights. Now remember, they're only attracted to bright light. Which actually doesn't make sense because then why would they leave this well-lit film studio to go out into the dark in the first place? Anyways, during all of this, Kyle asks to use the phone again, and the rest of them just fall asleep somehow. Yeah, let's act like we didn't just get attacked by a bunch of alien creatures who are now trapped inside of our van, and may still be around the house somewhere. So of course, one of the hobgoblins is still inside the house and taps into Kyle's brain, convincing him that Fantasia, the woman who he's been spending all of Kevin's money having phone sex with, is right outside the house. Do you... Do you kiss on the first date? I go all the way on the first date. My kind of woman. She gets him to drive all the way up to some kind of makeout point so that they can have sex, and then makes him drive right up to the edge of the cliff. And this is where she starts trying to push the car over the cliff, and for some reason, Kyle doesn't suspect anything is wrong. Do you need any help? Would you get back inside and wait for me? This time, don't move. So this this isn't weird at all for you? This doesn't strike you as odd? The fact that you're sitting in a car on the edge of a cliff and she's now behind the car trying to push it off of the cliff? Does it, does it raise any red flags for you? I'm gonna ring any alarm bells? Do it to me. And I don't understand what's going on here. First, she can't push the car. Then she can push the car. 
and now we've gone right back to her not being able to push the car again. This becomes even more confusing when Kevin arrives with a rake and proves once again he's just horrible with gardening tools, so she's strong enough to just throw him with one hand, minimal effort, but she's not strong enough to push this car and get it start rolling. And what's the deal with the ground here? Suddenly the car just starts rolling off the cliff out of nowhere. So when she was actively pushing it, wouldn't budge. But now that that force has been removed from the back of the car, it just decides to drive off the cliff on its own. We're halfway through the movie at this point, and so far the biggest takeaways are that the characters seem to be completely inept when it comes to defending themselves or their friends, and also don't really seem to grasp the reality of the situation they're in. And here's more examples of this. Kevin gets attacked by one of the hobgoblins, which is somehow able to just pull him into the van, and Kyle just can't seem to hit the target that is right in front of him. Hit the creature! Idiot. And once Kevin goes back into the house, it's like everyone's just casual. As if, again, the things that occurred earlier never happened. What about this situation is normal? Like, what is, what, what is there not to be concerned about? The fact that you were just attacked by a bunch of vicious creatures who are, you know, to your knowledge, still locked inside of your van? That's just, what, it's just old news now? That was so 20 minutes ago. And in the midst of all of that, Amy, of all people, decides, hey, yeah, I want to go to a place called Club Scum now. None of that is odd. So they go to Club Scum, and the bouncer doesn't want to let them in at first. And I mean, yeah, you got to be selective. Obviously, this place is really popular. You can't just let anyone in. You might up, you know, violating the fire code. You know, like the fire marshal's going to come and shut this place down. All right, you know what? You got like two, four, six, eight, maybe maybe ten people in here. All right, you might you might start blocking the fire exits in no time. So watch it. I mean, how can you afford to be so selective with your patrons when you don't have any patrons? For some reason, they go in and sit down at a table instead of walking around and looking for Amy. After all, that's the whole reason they went there. But instead, they just sit there and watch the band for three minutes which unfortunately means we have to sit there and watch the band for three minutes. So after the band, Amy comes on stage and starts dancing and taking her clothes off. I'm guessing this is the work of the hobgoblins? This is her wildest fantasy? To be a stripper? Anyone can take their clothes off in front of people. You don't need some kind of special space alien magic to do that. Just some ambition? Goal-oriented mindset? Maybe some Jose Cuervo. What you're going to want to do is first try going up on stage. Once you've accomplished that, move on to taking your clothes off. Then see how many lap dances you can sell in an hour. Then try and break that record. The reality is that the only thing that's stopping you from getting naked is you. And maybe that indecent exposure charge, but that's only if you do it in public. So I guess the hobgoblins tap into Nick's mind and his sergeant shows up and starts preparing him for battle. I guess it's always been Nick's fantasy to throw grenades around in a private establishment. And the weird thing is, as he's loading up, Daphne is looking at him, obviously concerned, but when the shot cuts back, he's no longer beside her. He's actually behind her. So what is she looking at here? It's almost like me when I'm, you know, talking like this. What am I looking at over here? You'll never know. Maybe one day I'll, I'll show you guys what's over here. Maybe that's a good question for the comment section. What is Mark staring at in the corner of the room over here? What is over here? Is it a TV that's playing the movie? Somebody naked? Anyways, Kevin just can't seem to catch the hobgoblins, which are popping up everywhere. People don't really seem to care all that much, though. Just check out these reactions. And I have to say, maybe Kevin would have a little bit more luck catching one of these things if he actually started trying. Like, you know, moving a little faster while chasing it. Actually chasing it. What's funny here is that Nick keeps throwing grenades around, but it takes a while for people to even notice. <laughs> like, he throws a grenade, you'd think, you know, the, the <laughs> you'd think the explosion alone would uh, be enough to catch people's attention. But he throws, like, a couple. And then these other shots here obviously show people still just socializing. So let's show. It's me. 
faking my orgasm for you. Is that supposed to be sexy? Like, oh yeah, baby, you're faking your orgasms really getting me hot. That disingenuous gesture's really turning me on. So the sergeant throws out a grenade, and for some reason, Nick jumps onto it to save the troops. Which I don't understand. I mean, there obviously aren't any troops in this fantasy. The room is pretty much empty, so who is he saving here? Anyways, he jumps onto the grenade, which lights him on fire, because that's what grenades do. They go to the movie studio, and the guy from the beginning with the knife shows up. For a split second, you might forget what movie you're watching, and get excited to see a fight with nunchucks, but as soon as the fight starts, the nunchucks just disappear. I guess Leather Jacket Dude wasn't really ready to be disarmed by Kevin's incredible skill of pushing someone. Turns out it was all a fantasy, and after McCready shoots the hobgoblins causing it, all the others run back into the film vault. Which is perfect because McCready rigged it up with explosives and detonates them, killing all the hobgoblins. Which begs the question, why did you wait until now to do this? You witnessed the entire downfall of a movie studio at the hands of these things, and ju just now you decide, yeah, you know what, uh, I think I'll kill them now. I think I'll blow them up. Kyle tries to impress Daphne by giving her a corsage. I mean, the guy is so starved for sex, he seems to be getting off just pinning it to her shirt. Well, this is for you. <laughs> really? <laughs> Really? <laughs> Suddenly Nick shows up in good spirits. I guess somehow he managed to survive being completely engulfed in flames. And not only that, but his clothes, hair, and face seem to be completely untouched as well. To be honest, I don't think Hobgoblins was a movie that took itself too seriously. However, I can still see why it's considered by many to be one of the worst movies ever made. There was also a sequel made to Hobgoblins in 2009, but before you ask, no, I won't be reviewing it. I am currently already, as you're watching this, I'm already editing my next video, which is on the Emoji Movie. Yes, I watched the Emoji Movie, and I survived. And I know what you guys are thinking. It's going to be like months before you see that video, but that's not true. You're going to see that video very soon. And in fact, you're going to see quite a few videos very soon uh, because I had mentioned this on my Facebook page and my Twitter, but uh, recently it was kind of like the uh, slow time for work for me. So I was able to take uh, about two weeks and just work on this writing reviews uh, nonstop. And I got a bunch of reviews already written. Uh, I'm filming them all right now and then I just have to edit them. So we're finally uh, hopefully gonna start seeing some videos come out on a regular basis on this channel, which I know is hard to believe, but that's what I've been working towards uh, these past couple weeks. So thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time. Nick tells Kevin that he'll reach him. Um, Nick tells, so Nick, uh, so, yeah, what was his Daphne's boyfriend Nick? Yeah, he tells. <laughs>